Thank you very much. So in the next uh, 20 minutes, we'll discuss about the management of non-obstructive azoospermia, or if you want, what your endocrinologist can do for you before involving our uh, urologist and our gynecologist. These are my conflict of interest. They are mainly academic and non-commercial. So what we are going to do, we are going to discuss a little bit about the principle of therapy concerning non-obstructive azoospermia. We'll discuss the available options and I'll try to be as practical as possible to discuss the choice of the optimal therapy. So let's kick off. What are the principles of uh, therapy of non-obstructive azoospermia? I would mention three. First of all, the obvious, evaluate both partners. If this is the male and this is the female and their reproductive capacity, let's say from zero to 10, the same is true for women, it's very uncommon that Mr. 10 will be in a relationship with Mrs. Zero or quite the opposite. On the other hand, it's very probable that a man with, let's say, a reproductive capacity of seven will be eventually a father if his spouse has a reproductive capacity of nine, but this will not be true if the reproductive capacity is four. So if you know only one part of the couple, it's absolutely impossible to comment about the outcome. So the obvious is there, investigate both. The second thing I'd like to stress is try as much as possible to make an etiological diagnosis. Sometimes the only thing we do is just a spermiogram or a couple of them, and then we think we have a diagnosis, although it's only a, sem a semen diagnosis, and then we apply management according to this. If we want to oversimplify things, then the whole reproductive ontology is, is one slide. If the spermiogram is normal, you can proceed with natural conception. Why not? If you have a mild oligoastenoteratozoospermia, then you may proceed to intrauterine insemination. If the things are a little more severe, then most probably you have to do ICSI. And if you, are, if you have azoospermia, you have to go to TESE or a donor sperm. And that's it. So is this the right way? I would say no. And this is the wrong way. If this is the wrong way to approach a man, what is the right way to do this? Well, we are going to do exactly what we do in every other field of medicine. We'll start with clinical examination, history and physical examination, hormonal evaluation, seminal evaluation, and seminal, it's not only the uh, the spermiogram, we discuss a lot about it, the imaging. I wouldn't think a single man without having this four cardinal examination, and then according to the results, not in all men, you may have a histologic examination, a genetic examination. So you will always try to have an etiologic diagnosis and then apply treatment according to this. Of course, you have you have benefit for every type of, uh, every aspect of it, and it's very obvious that if you ask these questions, it takes a couple of minutes uh, to, to, answer, to ask these questions to a man, you are going to have valuable information about the whole fertility. Very important, even if you're examining the, the man, it's the female factor. You are going to, to do different things, a different approach if the woman is 42, and quite a different approach if the woman is, is 22. Clinical examination, very easy to do it. This is the Yugonadal David, and this is the Hypogonadal David. So it's easy to do it, and uh, the testis is one of the organs that is probably the most easy to palpate. Uh, the, the testis itself has uh, the, the vast deference as well, so please do it. Sperm concentration, it's not hematocrit, so there is a great variability and you need uh, at least a couple, sometimes more of spermiograms in order to have an idea. Um, it's a normal man, a healthy man, I mean a father, that it happened for various reasons from time to time to have very low sperm concentration near azoospermia in uh, a case and you can uh, have many reasons uh, for this. Hormonal investigation, the basics, the axis, FSH, LH, testosterone, SHBG to correct testosterone, TSH, thyroid disease, 10%, 15% of the general male population, and the prolactin. Additional only if 
uh, needed. Testicular ultrasound, we discussed it with Professor Aidos, I think, before. I wouldn't think a single case without a testicular uh, ultrasound, most probably in couple with a, with a testicular uh, triplex. This is, of course, an additional. Our urologists may need it from time to time. And these are additional uh, exams as well, uh, cytology and histology, if in a case of an obstruction or TSA if needed. And of course, the basic genetic examination, karyotype and YQ microdeletions, once again, if needed. So if you want to see the glass that the gulls is half uh, empty, you would say that in one third of the cases, you do not have an etiological diagnosis. But if you want to see the glasses being half full, then in the other 67%, you can have an etiological uh, diagnosis. And this is invaluable for the couple, not only for the first children, but the, uh, the future uh, children uh, as well. The third principle would be uh, that infertility is a proxy of general health. So it's not only uh, 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 reproduction that's usually a, a luxury for the man. You may have many other reasons for this, testicular degenesis, the populations are disturbed, so you ha may have different phenotypes, testicular maldicent, hypospadias, uh, reduced semen quality, or even testicular cancer. So according to the Skyke bike, the testicular degenesis syndrome, it's not only the obvious, even the regular infertile men with impaired spermatogenesis only, with not the other phenotypes, still has a higher probability of testicular cancer uh, compared to the general population. And this is something that we must always have in mind. It's all, not only reproduction, it's the general male health. So having said this, let's say, what are the available options before going to surgery or uh, assisted reproduction techniques? We have, first of all, a series of management that I would refer to them as etiologic. If you have hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, Kalman syndrome, all the equivalents, then gonadotropins is the first line treatment with a very high probability, almost 90%, of achieving inducing spermatogenesis. If you have a prolactinoma, rare, but it's there, endocrinologists see it, then the treatment is dopamine agonists, and everything would be in order. And of course, the very common hyper or hypothyroid, they have an effect on spermatogenesis, so the etiologic treatment is antithyroid medication and L-thyroxine, levothyroxine, uh, so don't forget this. There is another uh, set, let's say, of treatment that I would name them as oriented. It's not exactly etiological, but if you have a, a MAGI, an infection of the accessory glands, our urologists will, will treat it anyway with the appropriate antibiotics, and this may solve the problem in, uh, in many uh, cases. And then we have the empirical treatment, especially the, the, what we call, what we have already defined as idiopathic male infertility, and then you can use clomiphen or tamoxifen, so serms, gonadotrophins, FSH mainly, antioxidants, but do not use testosterone. It will close the axis, so uh, you will have the opposite results. I will um, expand this a little bit more. So look at this. This is from uh, data from Mister. Different causes of male infertility. So before applying a surgical procedure or an assisted reproduction, you may solve and will solve actually eventually endocrine disease. But unfortunately, endocrine disease is only 10% as a cause of male uh, infertility. You will solve infectious diseases, sexual diseases, ejaculations problem, or of course. Um, problem with, uh, uh, with the males, sexual problems, systemic disease, human uh, immune disease, oncological disease, some other causes, and part of the idiopathic male infertility, as we'll discuss, may be solved. So roughly 50%, you have a good possibility of solve something like 50% of the 
cases uh, without involving your, uh, your uh, surgeon. And most of all, you are going to have an, an etiological diagnosis that will help the people. That brings me to the third part of this uh, discussion is how to choose the optimal uh, treatment. And I'm going to follow the, the ideas, the principles that put together with uh, Professor Kolpi and with Alexander Giverkman, he was with us uh, online two, uh, two hours ago, and this is the European Academy of Andrology Management of Oligoasthenoteratozoospermia. Today we are discussing azoospermia, but you can imagine azoospermia is the extreme part of oligoasthenoteratozoospermia, we discuss it. So, these guidelines have two degrees, two grades of recommendation. We strongly recommend and we suggest one or two. And if you have more crosses there, that means that you have higher evidence. So, before surgery, before the urologist, before the gynecologist, we have the lifestyle and the medical approach. And I'll try to make easy for you. Lifestyle. Three positive recommendations. Quit cigarette smoking. Anyway, it's, the evidence is not very good because we do not have randomized studies. We will never have, but it's always good to do this. Reduce weight. And the third is reduce or even quit alcohol consumption. And two, negative recommendation. It's no need to quit physical activity. We used to, to recommend this at some times. And it's no use to use to apply scrotal cooling or change your clothes or working condition. There is no good evidence that this would be of, uh, of any help. Of course, you are scientists, so you need the evidence. And I give you a couple of references for every one of these things I have discussed with you. So the evidence for cigarette smoking, quit, uh, overweight and obesity, alcohol intake, and physical activity, no need to quit. So that's about lifestyle. Let's discuss about medical treatment. You can use FSH. It can be suggested, although with low evidence, in selected men, usually in men in, as they do in this country, in Italy, normal gonadotrophic men with idiopathic oligozoospermia in an attempt, of course, to improve uh, spermatogenesis. The evidence is not good. I discuss it in some details about antioxidants and estrogens and aromatase inhibitor. The most important thing that is in many countries, these medications are, lo are not licensed for this uh, indication. So it's difficult for guidelines to include medications that they are not licensed. There is a medical legal aspect as well in this. And of course, we already discussed it. We recommend against therapy with androgens and the evidence is very good. So you can use FSH, of course you can use FSH for a clear case of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. Uh, if you want to induce puberty as well, you may start with ACG. But if you have, as we discussed today, a case of idiopathic male infertility, you can give FSH alone. We'll discuss what we can do before TESA in case of azoospermia. So why not to use it university? because there is a high degree of heterogeneity among, among studies. There is lack of precise criteria. This country, Italy, that's the only one know that reimburses uh, FSH. It does it only if your FSH is less than eight. So obviously there is no need to give FSH when your body produces it, produce it for free. The cost is high, so reimbursement is a thing. And of course, in endocrinology, in medicine, we know that uh, the, the circulating hormone is just an indication. It has to do with the receptor and with the post-receptor mechanism. So it's not just the level of FSHs, what, what FSH does in order to induce spermatogenesis. Antioxidants, it looks very etiological. We have oxidative stress. We discussed this today. And now we can measure oxidative stress not the sperm damage, even the oxidative stress. We can measure it today, produces ROS, results in sperm damage, DNA fragmentation. We can measure, we saw many ways to measure DNA fragmentation. So it looks very uh, etiological. If you give an antioxidant, it will work. But although there is evidence that there are no adverse effects, 
Uh, on the other hand, the evidence about their effectiveness is inconclusive. And I'd like, I try to put in one slide all the limitations that they have, all these studies. You can see here that we have uh, four uh, Cochrane database meta-analysis. And you would say, this is the best level of evidence. We have four Cochrane meta-analysis. What else do you want? Well, the problem is that the, the report of this, the conclusion of this meta-analysis is that antioxidants work, but exactly which antioxidant? Is it zinc? Is it folic acid? Is acetylcysteine? Is, is carnitine? What else? More often than not, we have mixtures of all this. Sometimes we have extracts. So 10 milligrams of zinc is, are 10 milligrams of zinc. But what about an extract of a plant? It's impossible to see what they. There is diversity in treatment duration. And of course, you need months. You need cycles of spermatogenesis, 70 days each, in order to have some results. So it's, you will achieve nothing if you give it for three months or four months. And sometimes you do not have the time to do this. There is a lack of indication for use. The studies are non-randomized. It's not antioxidants versus placebo. It's antioxidants before and after. And this is another type of study that's methodologically of superior quality. And of course, different outcome. Only male outcomes, seminal parameter, or female pa uh, outcomes, pregnancy rate, and this is not the same. Uh, in the next uh, uh, lecture, Dr. Datolo will speak about nutraceuticals, so I'm not going to uh, take his fame. Actually, he will discuss all about this. For my interpretation, they have the same limitation. In FDA, they are considered as dietary supplements. You can use clomiphene citrate. This is the way they work. Clomiphene citrate goes to the hypothalamus and the pituitary. It blocks the estrogen receptor. The body believes that there is no estrogen, although there is, so it produces more FSH, and this is the mechanism of use. Similar mechanism is the aromatase inhibitor blocks the aromatase enzyme, so from testosterone to estradiol, so the estradiol goes down and the epitutory produces more FSH. And this is the way they work. They have some limitation, the uh, anti-estrogen have a negative impact for, on skeletal health because your estrogen goes quite low. Uh, and more of, most of all, their evidence on spermatogenesis simulation is, I would say, uh, controversial. A final word about what you can do uh, in a man with azospermia before TESE. Do we have a clear way, efficient way in order to uh, increase our possibility of successful sperm extraction? The short answer is no. I've put in one slide whatever I found in the literature. Uh, HCG, of course, you will not, you will never give testosterone. We discuss it. So you give HCG or LH in order to increase testosterone, aromatase inhibitors, clomiphene citrate, combination of them, or even FSH. If FSH concentration are endogenously low, you would expect that uh, you will have an effect. If they are exogenously low because you gave HCG and you decrease uh, and you increase testosterone, it's another indication. On the other hand, there is no uh, not an approach that has proven its efficacy in, in the majority of the cases. So it's nothing that they can be recommended as a guideline. You need a good, uh, a good uh, gynecologist, urologist, in order to perform a, a test the way you have to do it. And of course, then you, we have our surgeons that will solve great many, uh, great many of these cases. So I have one minute. What? did we do today? We discussed the principles of uh, non-obstructive azoospermia. We discussed the available options, and I'll try to be a little bit uh, practical and see the pros and the cons of the, of the optimal therapy. Discussing the first, examine both parts of the couple. Uh, your diagnostic approach may be not like this, just a couple of spermiograms, but whatever you do in every other occasion in, 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 in clinical medicine, a full diagnostic approach, and always remember that infertility could be a part of a general picture. We discussed it already with Alexander Guverman. Discussing the available options, uh, if you have a clear diagnosis, more or less 
uh, endocrine, you can use your appropriate etiologic management. If you have infections, you will use your antibiotics. The urologist will deal with this. And if you have an empirical management, you have some options there. We have discussed it, like the CERMs, FSH, and uh, antioxidants. Uh, concerning the, uh, the, the, the overall picture, these are the three positive recommendations for the lifestyle. I recall it, smoking, weight reduction, reduce alcohol. The two negative, no need to quit physical activity or change clothing. Concerning medication, FSH and estrogen antioxidants, no androgens, no testosterone. And if you are a visual guy, you can see the algorithm, diagnose, uh, blood tests, lifestyle, medical, and then it's time for surgery. I'd like to thank the organizing committee, especially Dr. Kolpi for his kind invitation and the uh, opportunity to be in this wonderful city. And you have many regards from another wonderful city that is Thessaloniki, my hometown. Thank you very much for your kind attention.